Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Mike McGuire, and I'm incredibly honored to work with you representing Mendocino County in the California State Senate. Uh, we're thankful, thankful to each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join this critical conversation here in Mendocino County. We have literally hundreds of folks who are tuning in all throughout Mendocino County. And we have a very spo special focus tonight for our community meeting. Our focus is gonna be on our kids who are thankfully now back in school. And our focus is gonna be on immunizations against the coronavirus students and our kids. Let me be the first to say tonight's meeting, this focus, it could be a challenging subject. Look, I'm a new dad. Uh, and I know having a conversation about immunizing our kids, it's not always going to be easy. All parents want to be able to keep their kids safe, especially from this pandemic. And we know parents, parents have questions about the vaccine. And that is why we have brought together a panel of experts tonight. A panel, a panel of experts are going to give you the facts about immunizing our kids against this insidious virus and to talk about how Mendocino County Schools and the County of Mendocino plan to roll out immunizations across the county in the coming weeks. As you know, the vaccine, the vaccine is working here in California, and we're seeing the results in every corner of the Golden State every day. California now has the lowest COVID-19 numbers in the entire United States of America. Now, because of a relatively low COVID case count, hospitalizations, ICU stays, and deaths are down dramatically. And this is incredibly good news. As of tonight, about 73% of eligible Californians have received at least one dose of the safe vaccine. And we know that the best way to get out of this pandemic is by getting the shot. Vaccines are safe, they're abundant, and they're always free here in the Golden State. And it's the thing, single most important thing that we can all do to protect ourselves as well as our loved ones, especially as the holiday season is just around the corner. Now, right now in California, 15% of the total positive COVID cases are from kids and teens. COVID cases among children have been growing, which is why the state of California has announced that there would be a vaccine requirement for schools. So let's do a quick dive into the facts about how this would work. Right now, there is one vaccine available for kids ages 5 to 17, and that's Pfizer. Moderna and Johnson & Johnson has been authorized for ages 18 and up. So let's talk about how an immunization requirement will work in our schools, both public and private. First of all, students will be required to be, to be immunized to attend in-person school starting the term following full approval of the vaccine by the FDA. So this is what this means. Once the vaccine receives full approval from the FDA, the COVID-19 vaccine will be added to the list of vaccinations like measles, mumps, rubella, polio, hepatitis B, diphtheria, and tetanus, that all students kindergarten through 12th grade must receive prior to attending public and private school here in the Golden State. Now, based on current information, the mandatory requirement is, ex is expected to apply to grades 7 through 12, starting on July 1st, 2022. That date, I just want to be candid, is a bit squishy because we're still waiting for that full FDA approval. And the date for full requirement for kids in grades K through 6 is still to be determined. Currently, there is no mandatory requirement. And as you're gonna hear from the panel tonight, leading public health experts and physicians, the vaccine is safe. The vaccine is safe for adults. The vaccine is safe for kids. Now I'd like to be able to introduce our all-star panel this evening. We are so grateful that we have the hardest working county superintendent of schools in the state with us tonight. Her name is Superintendent Michelle Hutchins. We're going to hear from our public health officer. We're grateful for his dedication to keep our community safe. His name is Dr. Andy Corn. He's the public health officer for Mendocino County. We're going to hear from him in just a few moments. We have a leading pediatrician here tonight. She's a leading pediatrician in Mendocino County and throughout the North Coast. 
Dr. Ann Martin Coe is with us this evening. Good evening, doctor. And of course, Dr. Thomas Boo. He's medical officer for the California Department of Public Health within the immunization branch. Now, the most important part of this evening is from hearing from each and every one of you. There is, this is the great news. We've had literally hundreds of questions submitted tonight. We're gonna to try to get to as many as possible. And we also welcome the hundreds of folks who are watching in every corner of the county to be able to email us your live questions, your comments and your concerns to this email address now. You can email us at senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. We're gonna be taking your questions, your comments, your concerns live tonight. We're gonna to be asking them in real time to our all-star panel. Email us right now, senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. We have folks standing by and we're gonna be getting to your questions in just a few moments. But first, we're gonna to talk to the superintendent of schools for the county of Mendocino. If we could please welcome Superintendent Michelle Hutchins to the town hall. Superintendent Hutchins, thank you for your work. We want to thank the teachers and classified staff for their work during COVID. Superintendent Hutchins, thank you so much for joining. The floor is yours. Thank you, Senator McGuire. I very much appreciate this opportunity. As someone who spent more than 15 years in the classroom, I can tell you that even the best of times, teaching is one of the toughest professions on earth. It's rewarding for sure, but it requires hard work dedication and flexibility. If you enter the profession thinking your, your only job will be to educate children, you'll be stunned by the volume and variety of other duties as assigned. Teaching during the COVID-19 pandemic made a tough job immeasurably tougher. The past two years have been like no other. This year, when we returned to full in-person instruction, we all thought it would be better but staff shortages and quarantine protocol, protocols have made this school year the hardest yet. If you get the opportunity to thank any school staff member, please do so. I'm confident that they deserve it. One of the reasons teaching has been difficult in recent years is the concern of getting COVID-19. This is why the long anticipated approval of the vaccine for children's ages five to 11 feels like a critical step in our efforts to make our schools the safest and healthiest environments possible for students, staff, and families. An immunized community is one mitigation strategy that can resume school life to pre-pandemic normal, to schools without masks and crowded indoor cafeterias. In collaboration with Senator McGuire's office and the Mendocino County Public Health Department, the Mendocino County Office of Education is pleased to present this opportunity for families to get their questions answered by the people with knowledge and authority to affect change. Children are vaccinated through three primary avenues in our county. The primary care providers, pediatricians and healthcare providers, we have community clinics, both school and community-based clinics, and then your local pharmacies where you can stop in or call. Um, I do have a list of local Ukiah community clinics that are located on elementary schools that are being run by public health. And I'm gonna read the, where, the locations and the dates of those now. All of these clinics are from three to 7 p.m. And to get more information, you wanna contact the Mendocino County Public Health at 472-2759. So we have Chanel Valley happening on Tuesday, November 16, Capella on Wednesday, November 17, Oak Manor, Thursday, November 18, Yokeo, Friday, November 19, and Grace Hudson on Thursday, December 9. Now the other schools, again, you want, they're working with either community clinics or the primary care providers or pharmacies to provide um, the, the vaccines for children. I do know that the decision to vaccinate is a serious one, which is why we wanted to provide a town hall for Mendocino County. If your questions are not answered in full tonight, I recommend talking with your pediatrician and or healthcare provider who can address questions and concerns in more detail. 
And again, with the holiday season upon us, it's more important than ever to remain vigilant in our fight against COVID-19. And we must do all we can to take good care of ourselves, our families, and our community as we move a big step closer to the end of this pandemic. And please don't forget to wash your hands. So thank you, Senator McGuire. Thank you so much, Superintendent Hutchins, Superintendent of the County of Mendocino Schools. We wanna remind folks that we are streaming live tonight and if you need Spanish translation, simply click the interpret, uh, interpretation button right below. If you see the globe, click the interpretation button uh, and um, you will be able to hear Spanish language uh, streaming here of the entire town hall. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we now are gonna be uh, tuning in to Dr. Andy Korn. He's gonna be giving us a briefing on the county rollout of immunizations for students and kids. He's gonna be giving us a brief COVID update. What are we seeing across Mendocino County? Why vaccines are safe for students? He's gonna be covering that, why it's important to get kids vaccinated and also talking about the county school partnership. Dr. Korn, thank you for your service during this most challenging time of this global public health crisis. The floor is yours, sir. We welcome you. Dr. Korn, you are on mute and we're going to have you unmute yourself and then fire away, sir. Okay, great. <laughs> thank you. It's my pleasure to address our community. I am uh, the Mendocino County Public Health Officer and have been a family practitioner here in Mendocino County for over 30 years. Um, I want to know, I want to let people know that um, worldwide, the data shows we're now entering what appears to be the fifth surge. It's being led by the United States and Europe at this point. And this is not a good thing heading into the holidays and the winter months. Surges have nearly overwhelmed our health system and threaten access to medical care for all people. The best defense will be vaccinations. Mendocino County COVID data from yesterday shows a total of 7,923 people have tested positive for COVID in Mendocino County, and over 500 of those have been in the 6 to 12-year-old age range. A total of 94 Mendocino residents have passed away from COVID at this point. The cases daily this week are in the range of 30 to 40 a day compared to pre-Thanksgiving in 2020 of five to 10 cases per day. So I'm very concerned as we go into the holiday season that uh, we're on treacherous ground and the best defense, as I say, is vaccinations. But how have the children in uh, Mendocino done? Our county website dashboard shows small numbers in the ages, uh, in the younger ages, but it's important to understand that fewer children are symptomatic and therefore less are tested and less are reported than adults. When we look at the cases by ages in Mendocino County since May 2021, a troubling finding is that there has actually been an increase in the proportion of cases in children from six to 12 years old. And that is the most rapidly growing number, uh, most rapidly growing age of any group. Um, and this is very similar to what's being found now in England. In addition, in the last week in Mendocino County, the percentage increase in 5 to 11-year-olds is over two times that of the 12 to 49-year-olds. So we know that schools were pretty much closed last year and have been opening since mid-August of this year. In all that time, there have, 30, there have been 37 what we call exposure events, which is no more than two school linked cases. And there have been no outbreaks, which is defined as three or more cases linked to an in-school exposure. So these 37 events are cases which were brought into the schools from outside and they were stopped at the door by our sta school staff who are doing a fantastic job of teaching COVID safety practices, testing and warning contacts, working with our county team. So let's all thank, as uh, uh, Michelle Hutchins said, let's all thank the school staff for caring for our children. There were two recent cases that I'd like to clarify because the rumors have distorted this picture. An outbreak in Willits was linked not to the school, but to an after season football celebration. And that's important to distinguish. And the second case is a case in Potter Valley High School uh, where seven non-linked cases, not an outbreak, involved families that were resistant to masking, testing, and isolation, and refused to answer repeated calls by contact investigators, 
In response, the principal closed down the school to keep the other children safe. So it is important to follow the instructions. And then of course, if uh, you are called by public health or by the school uh, contact investigators and tracers in this case uh, to respond so we can keep the other people in the community uh, safe. Uh, so we must do everything to prevent unnecessary disruptions to in-school education and also after school athletic and social activities. The vaccines are key to this. So I wanna move on to that. As of November 14th in our county, 122,542 total vaccines have been administered. That is 66.5% of eligible people were fully vaccinated in Mendocino County. And that is a little bit less than California, which was 67.3%. Now these percentages are a little bit different than what was presented before because now we have added in those uh, children who are between five and 11 uh, to define who's eligible. People over 50 years old are more vaccinated here, but those under 49 years old are less vaccinated than California average. Um, from a racial equity point of view, we're actually doing very well um, vaccinating the Hispan non-Hispanic white at 62.8% and the Hispanics at 56.9%. There still is a disparity, uh, but that disparity has gotten much less in the last couple of months. And the Native Americans are uh, only at this point 46.6% and that number is also coming up. So how effective are the vaccines in Mendocino County? Mendocino County data at each age confirms what we know statewide at all ages. Unvaccinated people catch COVID seven times more often and they die 18 times more than vaccinated people. Though the absolute number for children are small, the national data shows COVID now to be the ninth leading cause of mortality in the five to 11 year old age group. Plus they suffer from disruption of their lives due to loss of school and social contact, loss of parents and relatives, and long COVID, even in those who are mildly affected. In addition, as was mentioned before, the children actively spread these diseases, this disease, whether or not they get symptomatic. So they can catch COVID and pass it on at home to dad or grandma or someone with severe vulnerabilities. So now we are so happy to have a COVID vaccine that has been proven to be 90% effective and with no severe side effects or complications in this age group. Vaccinating this age group will help us all return to normal as soon as we can. And so again, the uh, vaccines are gonna be available through pharmacies and through your uh, 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 children's primary care offices uh, and also uh, through clinic e events that are being held in numerous clinic clinics around the county. Uh, as well as special uh, events that are being held in the schools within the uh, um, uh, Ukiah and, uh, uh, and, and, and this area, our schools are gonna have school clinics. Uh, another place to search is vaccines.gov. Uh, and that usually has a very good breakdown of where you can get a vaccine. I wanna just mention that any child can get his or her vaccine in any clinic but they must have a parent or guardian with them and a signed consent. Uh, and these signed consents are being sent out by the schools, but you can also get one at the clinics. Also, if your child has an unusual circumstance or illness, or if you have more questions you feel you must discuss with your child's provider, make an appointment with your provider since the clinic events are not suitable to answer those questions. There'll be people there to ask quick, answer quick questions, uh, but not uh, questions at length. And with that, I'll end my presentation and uh, we're uh, anxious to go on and hear the questions from the uh, people in the audience. Thank you so much. That's Dr. Korn, Public Health Officer for the County of Mendocino. We wanna remind folks, if you need Spanish language translation, simply click on the interpretation uh, globe beneath this screen, uh, and we will be able to give you Spanish translation. We also want to remind folks, if you'd like to be able to ask a question, provide a comment tonight, we're taking your questions live, email us, senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. Uh, Dr. Ann martin Co has been on the front lines protecting kids for her entire career. Uh, and who would have thought 
that she would be on the front lines of a global pandemic during her career. And that is what she's been doing here for the last 16 months, almost two years now, Dr. Martin Coe. She is a pediatrician. She's the leading pediatrician here on the North Coast. She's with the Minnesota Community Health Center. She's going to be talking about the safety of vaccines, how do parents, uh, for parents, how do they get prepared to give their kid uh, an immunization? How are kids impacted by COVID? She's going to touch on that. And then also, what is the greatest risk to kids if they don't receive that immunization? Dr. Martin Coe, the floor is yours. We welcome you and thank you for your work. Thank you. So I just want to say, you know, what crazy anxiety producing times we've been going through. And I remember when we thought this was going to be a month and then we were going to get back to normal. You know, that hasn't been the case, but we're getting better. So I'm impressed with how much we've learned through science and we continue to learn more. Um, we are making big headways. So I'm excited to have this COVID vaccine available for five and up um, now, especially before the holidays. Um, I often get asked why we should vaccinate this age group because we've been fortunate that unlike most respiratory illnesses, it's actually been less severe for the most part in children. Um, but you know, cases are increasing in children. Um, we, we know they're increasing dramatically. Um, and even though it's a small percentage of kids who get very sick, um, it's still real. 39.9% um, of the multi-system inflammatory syndrome cases um, that can happen in children happen in this six to 11 year old age group. Um, that's an inflammatory response that um, people can die from, and it makes them very, very sick. Um, we know post-COVID syndrome happens in children too. In a UK study, um, seven to eight percent of positive cases in children led to symptoms lasting greater than 12 weeks. Um, we know that even with kids who had mild symptoms to begin with, um, they still are at risk for the multi-system inflammatory syndrome and for some of these long symptoms happening. Um, those long symptoms can be fatigue, headache, trouble, concentrating, muscle joint pain, cough. You know, the, these impact a children's ability to function in society. We know kids transmit COVID, you know, and kids need to be around their family and friends and peers um, for their mental well-being. So knowing all these things that we know about COVID and children, how can we gain control of this? So we gain control by masking, frequent testing, you know, outdoor activities and gathering, eating well, exercise, you know, keeping a sense of humor and laughing. But now we can vaccinate, which is key to you know, our social part of being human beings. And we can help our children make this easy. We do it by normalizing these things. You know, we we consider this like wearing shoes or using a car seat. You know, the more we make it just what we do to help ourselves be safe, the more our kids will be fine with it. Um, children pick up on our emotions, so we do need to certainly center ourselves, convince ourselves, and you know emulate that behavior that this is something that is good for them. Um, I feel very assured that vaccines are safe. You know, over 256 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine have been given in the US. We have lots of experience with vaccinations in children. And through my career, you know, we have discovered how safe vaccines are for children. And we're now giving, you know, many vaccines in pregnancy. We know the vaccines are much safer than the diseases we're protecting against. And in my mind, you know, when you do a risk benefit analysis, there is no doubt that the vaccine is much safer than any potential risk of the virus getting sick. So, you know, help your child, help our community be safer. You know, this is something that we can do and we are doing. And feel free to, you know, call, contact your provider. Um, any additional information, specifics about your family, you know, we're here to keep you safe. That's Dr. Ann Martin Coe, leading pediatrician. She focuses on kids' health here. 
uh, in Mendocino County. Uh, she is with the Mendocino Community Health Center. We're grateful, Dr. Martin Coe, for your work. Uh, and we're gonna be hearing from her in just a bit, answering your questions, your comments. If you'd like to be able to ask a question or comment, and we're seeing them come in right now, Senator McGuire at senate.ca.gov. But before we do, we're gonna go to Dr. Thomas Boo. He is medical officer with the California Department of Public Health. We heard from Dr. Korn, Dr. Martin Coe, on the ground level, what's happening in Mendocino County. Now we're gonna hear from the state perspective, and that's Dr. Boo. He's gonna be focusing on how getting the COVID-19 vaccine will help protected, protect kids ages five and older. He's gonna be talking about some potential side effects from being vaccinated and why it is so important to be able to look at immunizing your child and protect them from COVID-19. Dr. Boo, we're grateful that you're with us. The floor is yours. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, Tom Boo, California Department of Public Health and a practicing doc uh, in, in California. Um, so so I, I want everyone to, 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 to be aware that COVID has killed over 900 American kids and it's hospitalized tens of thousands of children. And, and, and we know that the chances that an individual child will develop severe disease are small, but all these terrible hospitalizations and death are, are completely preventable now. The Pfizer COVID vaccine for children is a very good vaccine. It's safe and effective. And, and this pandemic has been, as Dr. Martin Coe said, so hard on our society. And, and, and a lot of a lot of folks are, are kind of super anxious about the vaccines, but from a doctor's perspective, it, this is just simply an excellent vaccine, which will help ki keep kids and community safer. Huge numbers of, of people 12 years and older have received mRNA COVID vaccines this year, as Dr. Martin Coe said, here and around the world. And the effects of, of vaccination, both the safety and the effectiveness are being closely monitored in many countries, not just in the United States. No vaccine ever has been given to so many people and so intensively watched. And, and, and so uh, re regarding kids specifically, over 14 million children in the United States have been vaccinated. And when I say children, I'm talking about ages 17 to, to, to five years old, including 4 million in California. And among the newly eligible children between five and 11 years old, approximately 1 million kids have already been vaccinated across the US so far including my grandchildren and over, and over 270,000 children in California. So, so vaccines save lives and, and COVID vaccines are saving a lot of lives. The, the more people who get vaccinated, the more lives will be saved. The fewer people will get so sick they have to be hospitalized. The fewer kids and adults will suffer from long COVID. The fewer kids will be orphaned. Over 140,000 children have lost parents or caregivers. We've got the vaccines. It doesn't have to continue to be this bad. We, we've suffered tremendously through this pandemic, and, and we have a way to, to, to decrease the suffering now. mRNA vaccines are a new twist. They represent progress in vaccination technology, but the way they affect the immune system is, is, is really about the same as the vaccines we've always used to prevent diseases. Our immune systems aren't, aren't, aren't set up to respond immediately to a brand new pathogen. It takes time for our bodies to organize an, an immune defense. With an infection, there's basically a, a race between the bug trying to multiply, multiply as fast as it can and our body's immune system trying to stop it. And vaccines give our bodies a really important head start, enabling our bodies to immediately recognize and respond to the pathogen if we, if we do encounter it, if we are exposed to it. And I want to emphasize that the Pfizer vaccine is, is, is truly safe. It has only one serious side effect, which is myocarditis. It's rare. It's a serious side effect, but it's rare at any age. And mostly, and most such cases occur in young men and older adolescent boys. It's even more rare among younger adolescents in that 12 to 15 year old category. So we expect it to be extremely rare, almost non-existent in young children. We, 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 don't, we don't know yet. We do know that, that in, the, in, the, in the trials that were done that led to FDA approval, there were no cases of myocarditis. There were no serious side effects at all, but Rare side effects might not might not be found in in, in trials of, of, of that size. So 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 we're going to monitor it very carefully, and we expect it to be just as just, even even safer in the younger kids than it has been in the adolescents. And it's it's worth making everyone making sure everyone's aware that myocarditis is actually a lot more common with COVID infection than it is with vaccination. And myocarditis is particularly common in kids with multi-system inflammatory syndrome or MISC, 
the delayed complication of infection, which Dr. Martin Coe talked about, which has affected five and a half thousand American children, most of whom had to be hospitalized, most of whom were in the ICU. And myocarditis from the vaccine tends to be mild and short-lived. Most kids don't require any specific treatment and get better rapidly. You have about 30 and, seconds, Dr. Boo. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I just want to um, kind of hit on a, on a few other points. The, the, the risk of COVID infection are greater than the risk of vaccines at any age. And vaccines just don't cause long-term side effects, but COVID does. A lot of people suffer from, from, from long COVID, including kids. And mRNA just can't or won't cause long-term unknown problems. It's a, it's a very fragile molecule. That's why they ship it at you know minus 70 degrees ultra cold freezer temperatures. It breaks down very quickly to everyday molecular fragments or nucleotides. And there's no way it's gonna get in our nucleus, affect our DNA. It's not gonna cause fertility problems. There's just no scientific basis for this concern. And, and so finally, the most important reason to vaccinate kids is to protect the kids. But kids do transmit COVID, as Dr. Korn said, and vaccinating our children will help protect our families and communities, including those people who are more vulnerable, more at risk for, for getting hospitalized and dying. Thanks very much. Happy to take questions when it's time. Thank you so much. That's Dr. Boo from the California Department of Public Health. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to be taking your questions. Of course, we're going to be hearing uh, the comments that are coming in. We have folks sending their questions right now into senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. We're taking your questions and comments to senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's get right into the questions. Dr. Boo, we're going to start with you. Uh, we're going to ask each of our panelists to take themselves off of mute. Uh, each of the panelists are going to try to keep their answers to no more than 60 seconds, just so that we can get to the large number of questions that are coming in. So Dr. Boo, a lot of questions that are coming in. When exactly will the mandate be required in schools? So let's do the recap. Um, it's going to be about uh, six months after the FDA approval, but let's talk about that, Dr. Boo. When will we see the mandate? A lot of questions coming in, in K-12 public and private schools. Thank you, Senator. Um, I, I think most people anticipate it, it may go into effect for the, for the next academic year, but as of this time, Pfizer has not even submitted their vaccine for, for approval in the, in the younger adolescent age group. So that has to happen first then the FDA review process. So um, it, it's a hard question to answer definitively. So I would say, I mean, what we've heard from FDA, and this is, again, I use the term, technical term of squishy, um, those 712, grade seven through 12, the earliest would be January for July 1st of 2022, July 1st of 2022. But again, Dr. Boo, that's still squishy. Your comment? It, it's squishy. There's, there's no way about it. You know, again, it depends on the manufacturer, Pfizer submitting to the FDA and then the FDA review process and how long that'll take. That's Dr. Boo from the California Department of Public Health. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Dr. Korn and Dr. Uh, Martin Coe on this. This comment comes in from Kim. Uh, beyond your regular salary, how much are you being paid to support and promote this narrative? Uh, can you see how in doing so you have a share in the responsibility for all the deaths past, present, and future? How do you sleep? And, and I'm sorry, I, I just want to talk to Ken for a second. Um, Ken, 700,000 Americans have died from COVID, 700,000. And there is a direct correlation. You may not want to focus in on it. There's a direct correlation between when the vaccines became available and the death count now coming down, the hospital count coming down, the ICU rate coming down in this state, in this nation. It's called science and you should follow it. I get it that everyone thinks that they're a medical expert these days, but there is a direct correlation between when the vaccine came available and when hospitalizations, ICU rate, as well as deaths started coming down. But I'm not a doctor, so let's go to Dr. Ann Martin Coe. Um, pharmaceutical industry is not paying your salary. Uh, Mendocino County Community Health Center is, Dr. Ann. So let's talk about, about that, Dr. Martin Coe. So I just want to say, you know, correct. I don't get paid anything for promoting, you know, any vaccine or any medicine. I, you know, I'm in a career. I'm not in a job. This is my profession. This is something that I live with and I fall asleep every night 
you know, thinking about whether I'm making the right decisions and giving the right advice. You know, for 30 years, I've been thinking about this. And, and I continue to take input from science and keep on rethinking my recommendations every moment. So yes, I can sleep with myself. I work hard at being able to sleep with myself because I take this seriously. And now, uh, Dr. Ann Martin Coe, she is a leading pediatrician. And so Dr. Martin Coe, look, I, I think, and I, I'm a, a new dad, my child is eight months old. Um, and, you know, my wife and I had a serious conversation about immunizations and we made the decision to vaccinate our son. Uh, obviously the pandemic is scary. So talk with us about this. Um, why do you believe this vaccine is safe? Is this vaccine is safe because we've been following it. We've been having doses given. We've been, um, you know, looking for side effects. Again, the one side effect that uh, we were, um, that we saw with the pericarditis, myocarditis, again, it's infrequent and it's mild. And it's given, um, it's at a much less rate than what it is if you get COVID vaccine itself. So I've been in this career for over 30 years. I've seen us, you know, get rid of most of the bacterial meningitis because of vaccines. You know, we've seen over and over again how safe these vaccines can be and how they can prevent more serious conditions. Dr. Korn, public health officer, look, again, parents want to keep their kids safe. Uh, and this has been a terrible time for this country around the planet because of the pandemic. As a medical professional, you've, you've dedicated your life uh, to uh, medicine. Why do you believe that these vaccines are safe? And why don't you answer uh, Ken's question? Who's paying your salary, Dr. Korn? So, so I'll tell you, I, a lot like uh, Dr. Koh, uh, this is a um, this is a calling for me. I was ready for retirement after forty some years of being a family physician, um, and uh, and I decided to take a step down in terms of the salary and a much increase in terms of the time and energy being a public health officer. And I do go home and have trouble sleeping, but it's because of this pandemic. I worry about our county when I see those numbers go up, when I see another person pass away. It's very worrisome. And we have seen uh, through the years and years of, of my practice that um, uh, many illnesses, meningitis, uh, um, um, hemophilus influenza, chicken pox, measles have been, uh, have been stomped down to almost non-threatening levels. Smallpox, which we used to have before vaccines were effective, has been nearly wiped out worldwide. And, you know, it's not just the individual vaccines that I measure, but it's the, um, it's the process by which we develop vaccines. And let me say, as a physician, um, I'm, I have been asked many times, would you give this to a member of your family when we're talking about uh, medicines or vaccines? Would you give it to your child? And I always answer that question before I offer it to a patient. And my answer has been absolutely yes. The amount of scrutiny that these vaccines, you know, doctors don't want to make anyone sick. It's not, not, uh, it, it's certainly in the newspapers that occasionally a mistake is made. Uh, but our, our fear is that anything we do could cause illness. And, uh, and so this is one of those things that's uh, scrutinized before it even gets to be available as an emergency use. And we are in an emergency right now. So I think that these are extremely safe. Millions, hundreds of millions have been given across the world. And probably it's been evaluated more carefully with our VAERS network and, um, and so on and so forth than, than any other vaccine that we've actually made available uh, this soon after it. That's Dr. Andy Korn, the hardworking public health officer uh, for the County of Mendocino. So Dr. Boo, I, I wanna turn this over to you for 30 seconds. Um, folks talk about deaths from immunizing their kids or deaths from the vaccine. But when we compare uh, even side effects to deaths from this virus, it's off the charts. Uh, we have never seen in our lifetime, and God forbid that we ever see in our lifetime again, such a deadly event than this pandemic in the United States of America. So can you set us straight, Dr. Boo, on deaths, uh, 
impacts from the virus versus being immunized? Dr. Boo. Yeah. So, so thank you, Senator. Yeah, as, as I said, um, over 900 children have now died from COVID and these are now preventable deaths. I mean, we couldn't prevent all those deaths last year in 2020, but we've got the vaccines now. They're available down to five. They're not available yet to the, to the youngest kids, but no, no, no kids are known to have died of the vaccine, but over almost a thousand children have died from, from the virus and, and tens of thousands have been hospitalized. And this shouldn't happen in a country like America when we, when we have ways of preventing it. Dr. Boo, we're gonna stick with you and then we're gonna to go to Dr. Martin Coe. Melissa writes in tonight and thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, please admit vaccinated people spread the virus too. Testing is the best protocol. So I, I just wanna be clear, no one said that the vaccine is gonna be a solve all uh, for the coronavirus. What the vaccine will do is one, it will keep you out of the hospital. It'll keep you out of the ICU. And uh, for the vast, vast majority of Americans, the coronavirus won't kill you if you have the vaccine. So Dr. Boo, there's a lot of skepticism between folks saying, well, hey, the vaccine doesn't work because people still have a breakthrough case. Talk to us about that and how vaccines are supposed to work. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it's true. Um, vaccine vaccinated people um, can get infected and, and and can transmit. But as Dr. Korn said, the uh, the chance of getting infected is seven times less if you're vaccinated than if you're not vaccinated. And so if if you're you know if you're vaccinated and and, and the people you're around are also vaccinated, then then that's a multiplier. The chances of of, of spreading the disease with, to to getting the disease and spreading it to people you're around is is much much less. But I totally agree that, that vaccines are, are not the only answer, that testing is extremely important, as is masking and, and, and everything else, staying home when you're sick. You know, we, we, we have the means, we have the know-how to, to, to control this virus and keep people from getting hospitalized and death, dying. That's Dr. Boo from the California Department of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Martin Coe, anything you want to say on this? I, I agree with everything he said. I mean, it's... It's a piece of it, you know, nothing is going to be 100%, but it's a very important piece because if we can decrease the caseload, we'll decrease the risk of our vulnerable people who don't respond to vaccines and who can't be getting vaccinated. Um, we'll be protecting them and that's important for our community. That's Dr. Ann Martin Coe, pediatrician from Mendocino County Community Health Center. Uh, I wanna go to Dr. Andy Korn, the public health officer uh, for the County of Mendocino. Uh, Cindy writes in, will immunizations be provided at schools? Dr. Korn. Yes, we're, we're having uh, school vaccine clinics here in the Ukiah area. Um, the uh, clinics around the outside of Ukiah in Mendocino are usually uh, offering the clinics at special events that are gonna be closer to the actual uh, federally qualified health center or the rural uh, health center. So some uh, are having them actually in school and that'll be, uh, you'll be notified uh, through your school about which ones they are. Um, and that'll be for both first and second doses. And that'll take us through the end of the year. And after that, we'll, we'll let you know if we need to do more. Dr. Andy Korn, public health officer. We're gonna stick with Dr. Korn. Kat writes in, look, uh, again, I, I think uh, Dr. Martin Coe, Dr. Uh, Korn, Dr. Boo, there's nervousness in the community, right? Um, and so let's talk about what Kat writes in about. What is the county gonna do to track adverse reactions and deaths due to COVID shots as re required by law? Dr. Korn, so, um, how is that going to work or how is that working in regards to potential adverse reactions? We do, we do track it, but the main uh, way that it's tracked when it happens is that every uh, vaccinator, every clinic has to report to a federal program called the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. And we've done that for vaccines uh, uh, for decades before this vaccine came out, but this is probably uh, the first time that it's being used so completely. And as we get that information in uh, ourselves, we pass it on to the Vaccine Adverse re uh, Events Reporting System, VAERS, and uh, we get that information and we report it out to our community. So it is not an unknown. And of course, we know 
uh, when people uh, pass away, if they pass away right after a vaccine or in any proximity, if they have serious side effects, uh, if it hasn't been already reported to VAERS, then we do report it to VAERS. One thing to understand you want to explain is what uh, VAERS is, Dr. Korn? Vaccine, that's the initials for Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System that's run by the federal government. And, uh, and it is mandatory for vaccinators to report to that if there are any, uh, any side effects that happen. And then they can, with their panel of experts, determine whether there really is a cause and effect of the, um, rep of the event that's being reported and the vaccine that's been given. Uh, so it's not all slam dunk. If, if somebody, you know, for example, uh, uh, has appendicitis, uh, 10 days or five days after they get vaccination, that's reported and it's investigated, but it may not be a cause and effect. There is a baseline level uh, rate, rate of appendicitis, especially in young children, and it can happen. But if it's, you know, if it's consistent and we see an increase over the baseline level, then they can say, okay, that's a, a known side effect. And we're very liberal about what we consider a side effect, especially at this point uh, where there, where it's being given on an emergency basis but uh, as you can see, it's being it's it's going through because we're not finding significant side effects. In fact, the research so far has shown no serious adverse uh, events have occurred for, uh, in this age group uh, for this vaccine. The the myocarditis that was uh, talked about before is in the older teenagers and in the older teenage boys, and almost none in the younger mm -hmm. teenage uh, children, and none in this age group yet. That's Dr. Andy Korn, Public Health Officer for the County of Mendocino. Please, uh, Dr. Martin Coe. Yeah, so I just wanted to add to that the CDC has developed a voluntary telephone um, smartphone based tool that parents can um, send the information to the CDC. So although the Vader's system is very good, you don't have to feel like you have to depend on that. It is sort of a community sourced information feed also. Um, and so, you know, the CDC and uh, is looking very hard at trying to make sure we don't miss anything. No, absolutely. That's called vSafe, vSafe, and you can download it um, on uh, the Apple or the uh, Android uh, uh, websites. Thank you so much. That's uh, Dr. Martin Coe, along with Dr. Corin, uh, talking about how uh, any harm uh, from a vaccination is being tracked here locally throughout the state and nationally. All right, let's go to our next comment. Uh, this came in from Jerry C. Jerry says, and I'm looking here on the other screen, I apologize. I wish to express my gratitude. A little sarcastic here, hang on. I wish to express my gratitude at making it known at the outset of this meeting that the public will not be participants in it and that this meeting has a specific outcome in mind. The Senator's comments before introducing his panel with lavish praise sent the message, quote, this is theater and the script has been written. Jerry, uh, look, uh, we may not be able to uh, change your mind here tonight, but I just wanna give a bit of an analogy. If I need to go to court, I'm not gonna take a plumber with me. I'm not gonna ask a pharmacist to fix my leaky toilet, but, when it comes to the pandemic, uh, you're not going to trust a public health officer, a doctor. Um, I am not sure what has happened in this nation during this pandemic when the leading health professionals in this country has come out with a successful vaccine that is literally saving lives. Our death rate in California has plummeted since the vaccines. There is still folks who believe that doctors, quote, are paid by pharma uh, or uh, are working for some uh, government entity that's doing, that's trying to uh, cook the books. I, I gotta tell you, we've always trusted doctors to do the right thing. And it seems like we have absolutely flipped during this pandemic. 700,000 Americans have died. And let's not lose sight of that. Never in our lifetimes have we seen 700,000 Americans die in less than two years. Yet we are now questioning vaccines that have literally saved tens of millions of Americans' lives, especially those with chronic diseases, those over the age of 55. Uh, so I get it. You may not uh, want to hear what we have to say, but I got to tell you, it's based off of science and data. 
not off of opinion. Uh, I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, Dr. Martin Coe, uh, your comments to Jerry. I, I don't know what to say. Um, you know, I think that we're here because we believe in this. We're here because we research it daily. We're here because we're trying to help our community be safer. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin Coe, pediatrician, who has literally dedicated her life to the lives of kids. Uh, let's go to Dr. Boo. Dr. Boo, uh, have you seen anything like this in your career, Dr. Boo, where there's such skepticism, even when the numbers, the data, the science show us that something's working, folks simply don't believe it. Dr. Boo, what's happened? It, it really breaks my heart. I feel like our society is, 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 is almost broken. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say when, when um, we, we don't share the same values, we don't share the same reality, the same information sources. Um, I, 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 I work very hard to, to follow the evidence and do the best for, for my patients and um, dedicated my career to it too. And, and, and this is a, a very troubling time for all of us. And I just wanna say, this is not theater. Um, we haven't written the script. Uh, what this is about is damn science. Follow the science. And it's pretty easy to be able to look, again, I'm gonna keep coming back to this. The death rate in this nation and in this world continued to go up dramatically because we didn't have a solution. And that was a vaccine. Now that vaccines are available, uh, the death rate in this nation, in this state is going down, especially in California. Dr. Korn, your thoughts. Yeah, you know, I can understand when I hear some of these things that people call into question the integrity of pharma, making profits over you know sure. healthy drugs, and the uh, and the integrity of some physicians uh, and some politicians who you know work hand in glove with pharma, and so it could be a profit thing, but actually at this point we've seen and I'll I'll take a look at that three quarters of a million people we lost three less than three quarters of a million people americans in all of the wars since before world war ii all you know since the world war ii and beyond took us all that time to lose three quarters of a million americans well we're not looking the other way when i look at some of the um reports uh that uh that impugn uh, uh a lot of the conspiracy theories they're basing their their accusations on conspiracy theories, and there's a way that the you know that uh, that uh, some problems with pharma or other problems that exist in this country that have caused us to lose some trust are real, but they do not mean undermine everything and throw out as they say uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater. We have had an incredible scientific breakthrough uh, with this vaccine against a new. Uh, uh, pandemic that we've never seen before. And I think it's time that, that the population recognizes that. And I think probably 80% at least do recognize that, but are still a little bit concerned. And I would say, you know, those of us who are dealing with this day in and day out have, have done uh, similar work for decades are saying this time, this is safe and we should be doing it. And we need to do it to protect not only ourselves, but our whole community. That's Dr. Corn, Public Health Officer, Superintendent Hutchins, County Superintendent of Schools. Superintendent. Any comment on this? Um, well, you know, the one comment I want to make is 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 that our schools, when when people are um, punishing the schools for this for the vaccine mandates or even for mask mandates, it's really not the schools that are making these decisions. And it really does hurt the school community when you boycott and keep your children out of school. And so I, I would ask that when we have these discussions, that we have the discussions with the people that make the decisions and not with our local school leaders who are simply required to follow the laws that are given to them. Thank you so much, Superintendent Hutchins. I'm so sorry, y'all, but we are getting, uh, 12 questions now on ivermectin um and i want to just throw this out so uh, i don't know what has happened to us so catherine says ivermectin 
works on parasites and is used on COVID as well. How could this be a virus and where is the original virus? Dr. Boo, help us out. Ivermectin, explain it and let's talk about why it's not safe. Uh, um, unfortunately, we have about, let's see here, 11 questions. I said a dozen. We have 11 questions on ivermectin in our kids. Dr. Boo, please set us straight. Yes, so thank you. Um, ivermectin does not work on this virus. There, there were some initial findings in the lab that it seemed to inhibit the, the replication of the virus, but the, but, the, but the actual trials, the studies in different parts of the world that have, have tried to you know, determine whether this could be a, you know, a, a low cost, readily available treatment to save lives for COVID just haven't panned out. And, and so it, 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 it does not, uh, it does not treat the, the virus and, and it's a safe and effective um, drug for my dogs when they have worms and it's great for river blindness in Africa, but, but taken in, taken in, 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 in large unmonitored quantities, um, it, ha it has killed people in this country. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go to our next question. Dr. Boo, um, Melissa writes in, will there be an option uh, and will religious exemptions be honored? Uh, talk about religious exemptions uh, when we see a mandate in schools. Dr. Boo. Yes. Um, yeah, my understanding is that is that um, the current the current uh, state order will permit personal belief ex exemptions, which presumably includes religious exemptions. There will also be possible medical exemptions, but those will be quite limited, I think, to to, to actual um, you know allergies and, and, and life threatening contraindications to vaccine, and and um, the the system, the process, you know, for for the you know the process of writing the regulations and figuring out how this is going to work, it, it hasn't happened yet. There is no mandate mandate yet, but uh, but but personal belief exemptions will be permitted unless the legislature independently takes action to to pass a, a school mandate. That's Dr. Boo from the California Department of Public Health. We're taking your questions, your comments, and we're taking all comments here tonight. As you can tell by the forum, there is nothing that is uh, off the record here this evening. Uh, so let's get to our next one. This one comes in from Ann, uh, Superintendent Hutchins. Uh, Ann is a teacher uh, and she's just wanting to hear if there are any changes planned for school. I'm concerned that we as teachers have to use our sick days when we are quarantined for school related COVID reasons. So talk about uh, any changes planned for schools. Superintendent Hutchins, I believe that Mendocino County is gonna be staying in person and let's just be honest, uh, vaccines will help keep kids in school. Superintendent Hutchins. Yeah, so you, you've said it exactly correctly that you know vaccines will help keep, keep kids in schools. There's no planned changes right now for any of the, the ways in which schools are running. Um, we don't have any new mandates or any new changes or even even flexibilities with our mask mandates or with any of the, the current protocols that are happening with staff. That's it, is, it is right now. No, thank, please, Dr. Korn. No, I, I would just add um, the question that, that was raised is uh, would the school absorb sick days um, that are caused by COVID. Let me just say that uh, that employers are required uh, to allow uh, and, and give paid leave to people for getting vaccines that are required on the job. And if they have side effects from the vaccine, they're required to pay for that. And I think I, you'd have to correct me if I'm wrong. I think the schools fall into that category as well. So That's we correct. want people to get vaccinated um, and they'll get less sick if they're vaccinated. So there'll be less sick days to, to pay. We're taking your questions, your comments, your concerns in regards to immunizing our kids and keeping them safe against COVID. Let's go to our next question. This is coming in from Susan. Dr. Korn, uh, actually, why don't we go to Dr. Martin Coe because uh, this is about a 12-year-old child. Uh, Susan writes in to Dr. Martin Coe, if a child will be 12 years old in January, is it better to wait until then to get a full dose vaccine or get the smaller dose as soon as it's available? The child is adult weight, according to Susan, Dr. Martin Coe, pediatrician. So the, the given specific guidance with that, you should give the vaccine as soon as it's available. If a child gets his first dose, his or her first dose at age 11 and turns 12 in the meantime, they actually recommend the booster being the uh, the higher dose. 
Um, but it's also been studied in this age group of 11, and this smaller dose of a third is uh, gives effective antibody titers, and so it should be expected to work just as well. That's Dr. Martin Coe, pediatrician. Thank you so much. We're now going to go to Dr. Korn, public health officer. Uh, John writes in, Dr. Korn, do you have an estimate of how long it's going to take to vaccinate children's children age 5 to 11 throughout Mendocino County? Dr. Korn. That's a great question. Uh, we are hoping uh, to get it done by the end of January. I'd like to get it done by the end of December, but it has to do with how many people bring their children into the pharmacies, into our various uh, vaccine events, and to their clinics and their primary care doctors. Um, but we're hoping to get this group vaccinated uh, in the next two and a half months. And I think we should be able to do it if the children fill up our, our clinics. We certainly have enough vaccine and we have enough personnel to do it. That's Dr. Corn, public health officer from the county of Mendocino. We're now going to go to Christy, uh, Christy's question. Um, her question, Dr. Boo, it's a little split up here, but um, talk about child uh, kids in vaccines and natural immunity. If her child has already had COVID, um, what does that vaccine regimen look like, Dr. Boo? The, 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 vac the vaccination recommendations are, are the same for people who have, have, who have had previous infection. And, and, and previous infection does provide protection, but it, it varies a lot from person to person. It, it is, our understanding is that people who have mild, relatively um, light symptoms do not mount as much of an immune response, do not get as much protection after, after infection as people who have more severe disease. And we know that people who have vaccination after being infected have probably the best immune response and, and greatest protection. So, so um, we, we recommend, CDC recommends vaccinating without regard to, to previous infection status. We're taking your questions, your comments tonight. Thank you so much for joining with us. We still have several hundred folks who are tuning in to our critical community meeting all on immunizing our kids and keeping them safe against COVID-19. We're joined tonight with the superintendent of Mendocino, Mendocino County Schools, Michelle Hutchins. We have Dr. Ann martin Coe. We're grateful that Dr. martin Coe is with us. She's a pediatrician at Mendocino Community Health Center. We have Dr. Boo from the California Department of Public Health. And of course, Dr. Andy Korn. He's the public health officer for the county of Mendocino. Uh, we are now going to Dr. Ann martin Coe. And Nessa writes in, um, how safe is the COVID-19 vaccination for our children? Uh, Dr. Ann martin Coe. So again, it's, it's very safe. And it's much safer than the risk you would get from having your child develop COVID um, virus itself. So the, any of the side effects are minimal, um, short in duration, and um, and, and protecting, you know, we all often, you know, worry about the sore arm and the fever and feeling, you know, sick for a few days. But those are things that, you know, are short term. Um, if we can prevent a COVID infection that potentially has, you know, long term side effects and you know, potential hospitalization and potential um, death, even, then it's, it's not a question in my mind which one uh, you should do. You should vaccinate your child to protect them. Thank you so much, Dr. Ann martin Co. Uh, let's go to the next question, Dr. Boo, from Melissa. She writes in tonight, uh, what are the statistics of kids becoming severely ill, dying from the regular flu compared to COVID? Um, RSV kills more children than COVID. What is the statistic compared to COVID, Dr. Boo? Yeah. Um yeah, um, influenza and RSV are indeed um, serious threats to the to the uh, to the health of children. Uh, flu in a bad year can can hospitalize a lot of children and, and and kill hundreds. We have a vaccine against flu; it's not perfect, but but we but I would ask you to to seriously consider getting your kids vaccinated for flu and COVID this year. And there is there is some real serious work and progress going on for a vaccine against RSV as well. And I look forward to that becoming available to our children too. Uh, I'm gonna go to Dr. Korn. Tammy writes in, long uh, question. Thank you so much, Tammy, for writing in. Um, she says that um, people don't acknowledge that there can be, and, and I'm paraphrasing here a bit, uh, people don't acknowledge that there can be a middle ground, not just with 
vaccines. I was hoping to be educated on a neutral basis. My kids have gotten all the vaccines they were supposed to get, but I'm just unsure about this one. I would also be very nervous about any other new vaccine. I know scientists have been working on it a long time, but I hope you get to what I'm trying to say. I'm worried that people will want to drop mask mandates once there will be a vaccine mandate. A lot of people viewing the vaccine as their, quote, safety blanket to go back to pre-COVID times. Dr. Korn, Tammy brings up some good points. If you want to answer that, please. Yeah, I, I, I certainly do. So we give vaccines for uh, to prevent vaccine preventable diseases. And COVID certainly ranks, uh, if you look at deaths uh, over a period of time uh, and you compare it to hepatitis A, three deaths um, before the hepatitis vaccine came in for in the prior year. Meningococcus, eight. Varicella or chickenpox, 16 died. Uh, rubella, before it was uh, a vaccine, 17 died in a year. Rotavirus, 20 died in a year. COVID has killed 66 children in the last year. So there certainly is a reason to do it, to, to get the vaccine. However, I don't think that we should be abandoning masks. Masks are an incredibly safe, effective, and accessible and inexpensive way to prevent the transmission of disease. They are a very big fallback. Keeping people out of work who are sick, it should go without saying, it's a community responsibility. And uh, washing our hands frequently helps, helps also. All those non-pharmacological interventions continue to be important. When we have enough people vaccinated and we can see uh, that the effectiveness of the vaccines and, and we've tamped down the virus enough that we don't need some of those things, then we can start withdrawing them. But it, it doesn't mean that we should get rid of them overnight. Uh, there are some counties in California who are, who are uh, saying, when we get to this number, we'll drop the mask mandate. I'm not so sure that that's wise yet because we don't know when we'll get there. And this, vac this, uh, this uh, virus has surprised us at least four times in the past, and it could surprise us again. And if we don't hold the numbers down, variants can emerge that could even uh, undermine the safety or the efficacy of the vaccine. So no, the non-pharmacological interventions are still very important, and I hope we continue to do them for a while. Uh, multiple uh, efforts underway, no silver bullet at this point. Uh, so Dr. Korn, thank you so much. I wanna go to Dr. Ann martin Coe. Uh, leading pediatrician here on the North Coast. Marissa writes in, will there be, will, will there be, need to be a booster shot at six months out for five to 11 year olds? Should the second dose be stay, spaced at three weeks or four weeks out from the first? Dr. Martin Co. So uh, with the Pfizer vaccine, um, the second dose is three weeks after the first. It can be longer, but not shorter. Um, the sooner we get fully vaccinated, um, the sooner we're protected against the COVID virus. So as far as a booster in six months, um, we haven't had that long to find out yet. So that's what the science will be following. You know, we um, have looked at that from um, for the adults. And I was very impressed with all of the dialogue that happened among all the various scientists, you know, several different committees of groups of scientists looked at that, had open discussions, did risk benefit analysis, you know, looked at what was going on in the world. So we will find that out when we have the data, which means closer to the time that we would be thinking of a booster. Thank you so much, Dr. Ann martin Co. Dr. martin Co. is a pediatrician at Mendocino Community Health Center. We're grateful that she is here tonight. We're gonna to go into a little bit of a lightning round. We're gonna ask, uh, try to get to as many questions as possible. We're at about 7.38 uh, and we have several questions that are uh, still needing to be asked. So let's get to our lightning round. I'm gonna to go uh, to uh, Dr. Boo. Dr. Boo, Eric writes in, will the COVID vaccine be mandatory for kids that are in school ages five to 11. Yes, once it has been FDA, if and when it is FDA approved, it will be mandated in California. Yes. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, I wanna go back to doc, Dr. Boo. We're still getting a lot of questions. I know we covered this, but you know, folks are tuning in, tuning out throughout the evening, folks are busy. So uh, this next one is, will there be vaccine opt-out options? Um, this individual, uh, Dale, does not believe that the vaccine is acceptable as a mandate. Dr. Boo. 
Yeah, I, I believe we're, we're asking about the, the school mandate. And yes, yes, there will be both personal belief exemptions and, and medical exemptions that, that are possible. All right. Uh, Frank writes in, and I want to go to uh, either Dr. Korn, Dr. Martin Coe. Frank is saying that um, downplaying the side effects of, um, you're going to help me out, Dr. Martin Coe, uh, Myro. Myocarditis. Myocarditis, yes. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That is why I'm not a doctor. Uh, and so Dr. Uh, Martin Coe, uh, Frank is saying you have to make it clear. It's not dangerous. It's a side effect. People with COVID get serious. Uh, this, this seriously vaccinated people only get a mild version. So what would you say to Frank on this issue in regards to downplaying that side effect? So I think we've been, you know, open and transparent with this. It's something that I tell my patients when they get it, um, what to look for, you know, when to seek help. Um, but it has been transitory and mild. And we know that the cases of myocarditis and pericarditis um, are severe in, in COVID, much more severe and require hospitalizations. Now, the other thing with these younger kids is that um, post-viral myocarditis and pericarditis typically is a post-puberty syndrome. So typically it's age 16 through 29. And so we're really not expecting that as a side effect in this younger age group. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Korn, any thoughts on that? Oh, uh, absolutely. So uh, myocarditis is not new to the vaccine. Uh, it exists not only with COVID, but with many other illnesses. And actually, when you look at the uh, severity of myocarditis in those people who've had vaccines, and that's the cause, um, the, the course uh, and the severity of the myocarditis is, is, is very short and very uh, mild. It's usually treated at home with uh, something like aspirin or Tylenol just for the discomfort. And you're over it in a few weeks. Sometimes it, it's up to a month. I don't want to play it down. But compared to myocarditis and some of the other viral illnesses, um, it's a much lighter, lighter uh, uh, disease. Thank you and so it's much. It's actually usually over in like two to three days is the normal, more common course. I want to stick with you, Dr. Martin Coe. Uh, John writes in, um, will this be an annual vaccine? Can COVID still be spread after vaccination? If so, I'm paraphrasing here, Dr. Uh, Martin Coe. If so, does this really make it any safer for other kids? Um, and what are we doing to mandate to prevent the leading eight other ways of death uh, that was mentioned by Dr. Korn? But Dr. Uh, Martin Coe, talk to us about uh, your, your belief, you think this is going to be an annual vaccine? Can COVID still spread, be spread after vaccination? And if so, does this make it any safer for our kids? So um, again, I think we'll follow the science, we'll continue to monitor, and we'll decide when boosters are needed. Um, I won't be surprised if they're needed, just like they're needed for tetanus, just like they're needed for influenza, um, but we'll see. Um, it's it can be spread from kids who aren't having symptoms and who have been vaccinated, but as we've stated before, at a much lower rate um, than people who are not vaccinated. And yes, this is a relative thing. This will make our kids safer. It's not the only thing that we need to be doing. I think of it as like a car seat. You know, we're, it won't prevent every injury from a car accident, but it's much safer than being without the car seat. Dr. Korn, uh, did you want to chime in on this? Yeah, well, I think uh, there may be a misunderstanding in how we discover things and understand them. And this, this uh, illness is uh, a year and a half old. We're still learning about it. And the vaccine is less than a year old. And it takes time for us to accumulate that information. What we've found so far is that the vaccine works very effectively and it's very safe. When that came out for adults, we were really hoping, had our fingers crossed, it would last for a year. Now we're finding that uh, the efficacy wanes in terms of getting the infection. But you know, the efficacy is still there in terms of keeping people out of hospitals and keeping them from dying. So as we accumulate more information, we know more and we can answer some of those questions a lot easier. Right now, there's a lot of qu answers to those questions. I'm just going to beg off and say, duh, I don't know. We'll find it out as it comes up. Dr. Corn, thank you so much. I want to go back to Dr. Martin Coe, pediatrician. Um, Jonah writes in, and look, 
folks have a right to be concerned, right, Dr. Martin Co. Uh, this has been a hell of a last 16 months, and uh, it's pretty extraordinary what we've seen in regards to the speed of this vaccine. Jonah writes in, is this immunization an ongoing study or is it a guaranteed solution? Looking forward to speaking to our community's influencers and getting direct answers to our questions, Dr. Martin Co. So nothing's ever a guaranteed solution. And I think what we're looking at is it's a piece of, of the things that we can do. We do know that it's safer than being exposed and getting COVID virus itself. So it's a piece of it. It helps prevent hospitalization. It helps prevent severe disease. Um, it's the right thing to do. Dr. Martin Coe, pediatrician, please. Dr. Korn, a public health officer. Yeah, I, I would just add another thing. I don't think we've hit on uh, as much as we could during this, uh, this um, exchange, and that is we need to tamp down the numbers of infections as quickly as we can before another variant emerges and cripples the capability of our vaccines. So it is very urgent to get everybody vaccinated. This is the adults who have not yet decided to be vaccinated. This is the people who need boosters, those people who are immune compromised may not have had the responses. And for the children as well, we want to keep the numbers of virus multiplications to a minimum so we don't have mutations happen and variants emerge that could undermine the efficacy of the vaccination. As Dr. Corn, public health officer for the County of Mendocino, we're gonna to go to our final four questions uh, as we are gonna be wrapping up here. Uh, we are really grateful that all of you have tuned in. So many folks have hung with us tonight. Thank you so much. A lot of great questions coming in here this evening, comments. Um, I wanna to go to the next um, question to Dr. Boo. July asks, how is it safe when it hasn't been tested for children yet? It, it has been it has been tested for children. Um, there were uh, the manufacturer conducted a trial of of four thousand five hundred plus kids, and there were no serious side effects seen in, in, in that group. And and it and it's really important to to recognize, as Dr. Martin Coe said, that the vaccine has been used in in over two hundred fifty million people in total, and fourteen million of them have been have been children you know, of a slightly older age. So we have a lot of experience with this vaccine already and, and, it, and it's gonna to prove to be safe in the younger age group too, as we go forward. And in a little while, this is just gonna be another vaccine. Right now, everyone's a little freaked out because uh, it's new, because the pandemic has, has, has rocked us to our core, but this will just be another good effective vaccine that, are, that, are, that, that kids and adults get when they need it. Dr. Boog, Halford Department of Public Health, thank you. We are now down to our final three. We're going to go to Superintendent Hutchins. We're going to ask each of our panelists here tonight to also give us a 30-second close. Uh, Superintendent Hutchins, um, Jacqueline writes in, what are the next steps to inform the Spanish-speaking families about this topic? So, uh, Superintendent Hutchins, why don't you cover how the schools are going to be reaching out uh, to Spanish-speaking families. And then I'm going to go to Dr. Korn and give us a perspective from the County of Mendocino, Superintendent Hutchins, Mendocino County Superintendent Schools. Well, one of the reasons we reached out to Senator McGuire to help us put on the town hall tonight was so that we could get the Spanish translation. Neither the County Office of Education nor the County of Mendocino had that capability through a town hall, like virtual town hall, like we're doing tonight. And so the so we reached out to the senator, and that is part of why um, he's joined us this evening is to be able to make sure that outreach does hit to our Hispanic community. All of our schools have the capability of translating, um, you know, the materials into Spanish. The county also translates its materials in Spanish. When you go to the public health orders and you look at the school orders, you'll see that they're printed in English and Spanish. And so we are making outreach in, in every effort that, that we can um, to reach the Hispanic community, especially tonight. Thank you so much, Superintendent Michelle Hutchins. Dr. Andy Korn, Public Health Officer on behalf of the County of Mendocino. So yes, we, since the very early days of this pandemic, recognize the importance of equity in approaching the control of the disease and getting the vaccines out. And we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion group that has helped us uh, and has uh, uh, helped us recognize commitments that we should make to the uh, Hispanic community, including translation. But also we have um, funded a, a uh, um, uh, 
outreach by a group of promotores, uh, de salud, who are community health workers who do speak Spanish and are part of the community. And we are increasing that grant uh, as we speak. Uh, the state and federal government also produces a lot of material, both in English and Spanish, and the county tries to get that out on our website as much as we can. So look, this is a, uh, a, a pandemic that is continuing, it's not ending. We're making great headway. We're not going into uh, into the future without a vaccine. We now have vaccine and we have non-pharmacologic interventions that work. We just all need to work as a community to get there. And I think if we do, we will, we will definitely make it through this. Dr. Korn, thank you so much, public health officer. We're gonna to go to the final question for Dr. Ann martin Co. Dr. martin Co. you did a fantastic job tonight. She's a pediatrician at Mendocino Community Health Center. Uh, Clifford writes in, it's a great question here. What provisions will be in place to allow parents to space doses according to their pediatrician's recommendations? Will kids be able to receive a digital vaccine smart health card? How will proper children's doses be insured? Great question, uh, Dr. Ann. So, I mean, there's a few things with that question. For one, um, the way that this vaccine has been uh, put in vials, um, it looks completely different than the other dose of, for the adults. And so it's next to, it, it's just not going to get mixed up with getting the wrong dose. Um, the, the recommendation is for 21 days from the first dose, but you know, there's not a mandate for it to be 21 days. If it gets extended longer for whatever reason, a recommendation from your provider or a personal reason, then it's still considered effective by giving the dose later. Um, did I answer the questions? You absolutely did, yes. Again, I think it's important. The vaccine vials that you're receiving have those predetermined uh, doses and only so many per vial. So that's how you're working it. So the, the ones for the younger kids have 10 doses per vial, but again, it's at a concentration that's different than the doses we give to adults. Um, the vial looks completely different from the doses that we give to adults. And so it's easy to know which vaccine we're giving. I, I lied to you, Dr. Martin Coe. I wanna go to one more question uh, as we've been getting uh, questions in regards to strengthening immune systems. So Lisa writes in, would it be better to serve our youth if the focus was on strengthening their innate immune systems to fight COVID? What's your thought on that? We've, we've gotten a few questions on that uh, versus the vaccine. And as a pediatrician, what would you say? So I don't think we have to choose one versus the other. We need to use all the tools in our tool chest. You know, I'm encouraging people to, to be at a healthy weight, to eat healthy food, to exercise, to, to you know, do all of those things that help us um, have a good, strong immune system. But this virus is contagious and this virus is aggressive. And as was mentioned before, um, our immune system is in a race with any virus or any infection that it hasn't seen before. It takes time to develop specific immunity. And so you can have all the non-specific immunity you want, but the virus is going to be growing and multiplying while our non-specific immune system is trying to fight it. And it's a much faster response when we have a template where we know how to attack the virus. So we need to do all of it. Thank you so much. That's Dr. Ann Martin Coe. Dr. Korn, please. Yeah, I would just add that, and this comes up with a lot of vaccines. These vaccines don't change the immune system or weaken the immune system. They actually strengthen the immune system. They're warning the immune system, this bug might invade, get ready. That's what the vaccines do. They prepare our bodies and our immune systems. So all of the other things that we can do to improve the immune system are great, but the vaccines also make the immune systems more capable. Superintendent Hutchins, last question. Catherine, uh, excuse me, Kathleen writes in, how long do you believe the mask mandate will be existing in Mendocino County schools? Uh, so talk to us about that. And Dr. Korn, I'm sure you're gonna wanna chime in on this one. Yeah, again, that's not a decision that your school leaders are going to make. It's a decision that your public health officers are going to make um, really at the state level. So. I don't have the crystal ball there. Dr. Corin, Dr. Boo, um, potentially might. <laughs> Dr. Corin, and then we'll go to Dr. Boo. Yeah, I, I think at this point, we're not taking the masks off in the school. If we can get uh, the children vaccinated and if the numbers come down quite a bit and we feel 
very sure that it's not going to jump back. Remember back in uh, June when we took down the, the uh, governor's uh, blueprint uh, and let a lot of the industrial industries uh, go free and people were thinking we're back to normal. And then all of a sudden we had the summer surge. The, we don't know enough yet about this infection to feel safe. Right now we have a vaccine that can make us more powerful and more safe, but there's a lot of uncertainties ahead. So I don't wanna make a prediction of when we're gonna take off one of the most important ways to prevent infection before it's pretty clear that that, that that will happen. Dr. Boo on the mask mandate, then we're gonna to go to closing comments. And we wanna say thank you to everyone who's been with us. Uh, we're still over 200 strong right now. Thank you so much, all of you for joining us tonight. Dr. Boo, uh, your comment on mask mandates in schools, and then we're gonna to go to closing comments. Yeah, so, so I'm in the immunization branch. I, I'm not in the Safe Schools for All program, but, 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 but um, my take is that is is that the uh, the, the the very conscientious and and, and, and intelligent um, folks that are that are trying to guide the the, the school response feel that masks are, are an important part of, of, of protection. That you know vaccination and and and, and testing and, and masks are, are are all separate different pieces of the of the key to protecting our kids. Thank you so much, Dr. Boo. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to turn it over to our panelists uh, to be able to provide closing comments. We're going to start with Dr. Boo, then we're going to go to Dr. Ann, then we're going to go to Dr. Andy, and of course, starting uh, and finishing with Superintendent Hutchins. Dr. Boo, 30 seconds uh, with the focus today of keeping our kids safe from COVID, 30 second closing comment. Yeah, thank you. So, so I, I, I think I just want to, you know, ask us all to keep our eye on the ball. As, as Senator McGuire said at the outset, this pandemic is unprecedented. It's killed a, three quarters of a million Americans, 750,000 people, and 911 kids, at, you know, as of this morning when I checked the CDC website. And going forward, no one should be dying. No, 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 no American family's kids should be dying of a vaccine-preventable disease when the vaccine is readily available just waiting for you to, to, to get your kids immunized. Thanks. Doc, that's Dr. Thomas Boo. He's with the California Department of Public Health. He's a medical officer within the immunization branch. Dr. Boo, thank you so much. Great job here tonight. We're now gonna turn it over, closing comments for Dr. Ann Martin Coe, pediatrician at Mendocino Community Health Center. Closing comments, ma'am. So I just wanna say that, you know, I acknowledge this has been a crazy anxiety producing time. And I think that's bled over to how we react to, you know, many other things. But I, I just hope that we can not focus that anxiety onto the cure. So it's not a cure, but it's a piece of keeping our children safer. If we can do the things it takes, if we can empower our children to wear masks, to effectively to get vaccinated, to keep their bodies healthy, um, then we can get through this. We can get through it together. That's Dr. Ann Martin Co. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Pediatrician with the Mendocino Community Health Center. We're now going to turn it over for closing comments from our public health officer, Dr. Andy Korn, who's been on the front lines of this pandemic. Dr. Korn, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for co-hosting tonight. So I'll repeat what other people have said. Uh, this has been a crazy year. Uh, we've lost a lot of lives. We've lost a lot of time. People have been sick um, and it's not over yet. Uh, we have to remember the non-pharmacologic interventions, the masks, the hand washing, the distancing, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the children uh, have a part to play in this also, and they have a risk. And uh, their risk can be addressed the same way the adults can be with with vaccination and that will help the entire community. Um, and so I, I would also say that for those on the line tonight, I hope that you are uh, convinced and that you'll bring to your children also that conviction that this is the right thing to do for them, for the family and for the community, because I really believe that it is that and it is our way out of this pandemic. And your sense of uh, commitment to it will also come across to the children and, and it will allay their fears. Thank you so much, Dr. Andy Korn, Public Health Officer for the County of Mendocino. Grateful, sir. Let's turn it over to our co-host for this evening, Michelle Hutchins, Superintendent of Schools for the County of Mendocino. Thank you, Senator. I know the decision to vaccinate is a serious one, which is exactly why we wanted to provide this town hall meeting for Mendocino County. This was not theater tonight. 
Dr. Korn and I had a conversation about wanting to be able to bring the pediatricians that have the answers to your questions to the general public right as the vaccines were becoming available. And it was, it was me that reached out to Senator McGuire and asked if he could help us with the capability to pull this off tonight. Um, this was not something that Senator McGuire orchestrated or even Dr. Corrin orchestrated. This was a collaborative effort between all of us to try to get the answers to the public. So if your answers were not answered in full, or if your questions were not answered in full tonight, I do recommend that you talk further with your pediatrician and your healthcare provider who can address these questions and concerns in full detail. It's a tough decision right now, but I thank you for attending tonight and hopefully we've helped quell some concerns. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent of Schools. That's Michelle Hutchins. Uh, we are so grateful that so many of you have hung with us uh, for the entire town hall. Incredible questions, comments, and look, let's just be honest. We're living in some really challenging times. So many have struggled with this pandemic and their health. So many have struggled based off of the COVID-induced recession and are struggling to be able to put food on their table. And those who have joined us tonight, they have one goal in mind to be able to keep our kids healthy. Uh, you have Dr. Korn who has been dedicated, dedicated to be able to tamp down COVID in Mendocino County. Superintendent Hutchins has been a leader, not just in Mendocino County, but throughout Northern California to be able to bring our kids back safe. Dr. Ann Martin Coe, you couldn't find a better voice for kids health than Dr. Martin Coe. She's dedicated her life to keeping our kids healthy and to be able to give you her blunt assessment, straight talk on why it is important to be able to get your kids vaccinated. And Dr. Thomas Boo, he's done the same. He's dedicated his career to be able to make this state a better place for all, focusing on science and good public health. And that's what we need right now. And yes, we are divided as a nation, as a state and as a county when it comes to politics. But I think that there's one thing that we can agree upon. We all wanna be able to keep our kids healthy. And yes, there are questions about the vaccine. When we take a look at the leading physicians, public health experts across this nation and right here at home in the state of California, the bottom line is this, vaccines are safe, they're plentiful, and they're always gonna be free. We encourage you to be able to get your family vaccinated as we get into the holiday months. We know that there's gonna be an additional surge. We also know that Dr. Korn and Superintendent Hutchins will be available to be able to have direct conversations with you along with the public health team in the County of Mendocino. Please keep your eye out uh, to newspapers, uh, of course, the radio stations across Mendocino County about the upcoming vaccination events that will be hosted by Mendocino County Public Health, as well as Mendocino County Office of Education and your local school district. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We look forward to working with you in the months to come. Stay strong, and we look forward to seeing your kids immunized in the months to come. Good night, everybody.